thing about asking God's spirit to like show up is that it does, right? And when we ask him to use us, he just might. And when we ask him to fill us, he will. And that's a unique kind of thing for us as followers of Jesus. It's, it's really unique for us. That's not something that the Israelites standing in front of Ezra and Nehemiah could do. Because God's spirit hadn't come to us yet. Jesus hadn't come yet. And I have to imagine, I'm, as I'm reading this, that Ezra maybe had an inclination that there was something better yet to come. That as he's standing there reading the word of God over people and as their hearts are being broken because they're being confronted with their sin, he pauses to stop and say, you know what? This is meant to be hopeful. So go celebrate instead. Because What's going to happen after that is that they're going to then reinstitute the law because that's what they had. They're going to go back to making sacrifices for their sin. They're going to go back to their feasts. They're going to go back to their rituals. They're going to go back to what they had before because it's what they had. But I think Ezra probably knew that it was all pointing to something that was coming, someone who was coming. And I think the writer of Hebrews gives us some inclination, some insight into that. This is what the writer wrote in Hebrews chapter 10. He said, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all, and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. The writer is pointing to say, you know what? Those sacrifices under the old covenant, they were just reminders. Much like the Israelites experienced that day as the law was being read over them, they're just reminders of their brokenness, reminders of, of how fallen away they are from God. And they must be repeated again and again and again, year after year, being confronted with that judgment, that guilt, the shame. But it was just a shadow of a better way, a shadow of something greater. He goes on to say, therefore, when Christ came into the world, God's son, taking on human flesh, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire but a body you prepared for me, a human form. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. And then I said, here I am. This is Jesus talking. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. Get this. First he, that's Jesus. First he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings, sin offerings, you did not desire nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. That's what they had at the time. But then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. Jesus sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. You understand that that system is no longer needed. That annual confrontation was no longer needed. That the guilt and the shame no longer needed. 
because Jesus made the sacrifice once and for all. It was a better way. I think that's why Ezra said, go celebrate. Don't linger here with this guilt. Don't linger here. Remember the hope that we have. He goes on to say, the Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this, the spirit that we just invited into this place, the spirit that resides in you if you're a follower of Jesus. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, their sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. That law, that word of life, that could never actually give life because it was meant to just remind us of our judgment, is now being written on our hearts. Not just on paper, not on stone tablets or electronic tablets, wherever you read it, but on our hearts, in our minds, so that we can live it out, the Spirit of God in us. That's something that that they could never have sung about before. That's not something they could have had before Jesus. Jesus made a way for the Spirit of God to be in us, to live through us. He goes on to write, so do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. Don't throw that away. Man, do you ever get reminded of like how you've messed up? And the more that we mess up sometimes, the, the less confident we get. We start to doubt God's promise. We start to doubt that that hope resides in us. We start to doubt that the Spirit could actually use us. Because we face ourselves every day in the mirror. We, we have people reminding us. We have culture telling us how we should be, how we're not enough. And we lose that confidence in the hope of the promise that we have, of the better way that he has given us. But don't throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere. Why? (laughs) So that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. He's coming. We have a promise to look ahead, a promise for the present and a promise for the future. And that's the hope that we have in him. It's what we've been singing about this morning. In just a moment, we're going to pause and reflect on the sacrifice that Jesus made, that he made a way for us to have a relationship with him forever. You know that God jealously desires you jealously in a world that's competing for our hearts he made a way through Jesus and as followers Jesus gave us a way to remember not just the sacrifice that he made but the promise of the future that changes our hearts in the present and changes how we live tomorrow Paul gave us some instruction for this in 1 Corinthians. I just want to share this with you. He said, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I love that. He gives us an insight back into Christ's sacrifice, but it's also a promise of the future that we are going to be restored with him. So then, Whoever eats this bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body. That's your own and the body of Christ and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup for those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, without discerning your relationship with God, without discerning your relationship with one another. You eat and drink judgment on yourself. So this morning, we've been confronted with that. 
maybe God has revealed some things in your life and in your heart that, that need to be rooted out. And listen, it's not to root it out in a place of guilt or shame or judgment. If you know Jesus, that's not what he's about. It's about restoration. It's about the joy of the Lord being our strength. It is the hope that we have. It's not, it's not meant to hurt us. He is always opening himself up to us. So follower of Jesus, take a moment and reflect on that in your heart. Is there anything standing between you and Jesus right now, face to face with him? What do you need to let go of? Is it pride? Is it arrogance? Is it an unwillingness to let go of a sin that maybe is entrapping you? You understand, he has freed us from that. He wants us to walk in that freedom. If you've invited the Spirit into this place, then you already know that. So let him take it. <laughs> let him take it. Don't negate the sacrifice of Jesus. Let him take your sin. Let him wash you and make you clean. So you can experience the joy. So you can celebrate together with the body of Christ, with fellow believers, with Jesus and the promise that he's coming again and the promise that he is with you now, today, and tomorrow. Paul wrote this. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, you know he's about to sacrifice himself and he's giving thanks for that. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. So do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. The old is gone. The old system of annual sacrifices, rituals, it's gone. This is the new covenant in my blood, and do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. It's in remembrance of the sacrifice that he made so that we could have a relationship with him, but it's also in remembrance of the hope that we have, of the promise of tomorrow, that when we come to him, he restores us, that he loves us, that he guides us back to his heart every time. Follower of Jesus, we have to walk in that. That is the communion that we have with him. God, thank you. Thank you this morning for your spirit. Thank you that you love us. And that as we worship you, the word of life from your spirit reveals things to us. Things that need to change. Things we need to repent of. Things we need to let go of. And that you replace that, God, when you take it, you replace it with purpose, with life, with joy, with contentment, with rest. God, we thank you for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, that he made a way for us. That we can come to you directly, that we can have a relationship with you. You so jealously desire a relationship with us. God, we welcome it. 
Forgive us when we push it away. God, we welcome it today. Don't leave us in a mess. You haven't. You've, you've promised us everything. And it's in that spirit we worship you now, God. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, your son, who gave it all so we could have life. Amen.